Hi everyone. In my previous video I left you with a uh, functioning uh, liquid crystal display. This one here. And I showed you how to hook it up to an Arduino and how to run some software so that you could write characters on the screen. Now I'm going to show you how to hook up four push button switches like these and uh, use them as a, a user interface. And these four push buttons actually occupy the same um, I.O. pins as the display's data bus. And I'll show you how to multiplex those together. <clears throat> now hooking up a, a push button to a microcontroller isn't, um, as, isn't quite as straightforward as you might think it is. For example, when you push on the button, you hear that click. What's happening is the contacts of the switch are closing, but they don't stay closed. They actually will bounce a few times uh, very quickly, and then finally they'll stay closed. And the microcontroller is fast enough to actually detect all those openings and closings. And so it might think that you've pushed the button a half a dozen times instead of just once. And the same thing occurs when you release the switch the contacts will momentarily scrape together and then open up and they also can bounce before they fully open and so you need to debounce these contacts you need to um, let the switch settle down before you finally decide that the switch is actually closed or opened and as I mentioned the word is called debounce, it debounce a switch and, and there's there's a number of ways of debouncing push button switches or, or other kinds of switches and it can be done uh, with components on the outside uh, where you use capacitors and resistors to give you a bit of a filter and a time delay and it can filter out those contact bounces which which might last for um, several hundred microseconds or more um, or even as long as a, a few milliseconds depending on the, the quality of the switch um, I actually tested these switches uh, with my oscilloscope and uh, they're surprisingly good. They, they don't bounce too much, but uh, I'm sure there's other switches out there. These are good quality switches and they cost a bit of money each, but there's also lots of cheap run-of-the-mill stuff out there and uh, those ones are probably going to likely uh, bounce more than these ones. So um, I prefer to do a debounce in software as it because it's actually pretty straightforward. And simply what you do is you uh, when you first detect that the key is closed you remember that key in its state and then you go away for a period of time and I use 20 milliseconds and then you come back and you look at the switch again and is it in the same state again? Is it still closed or is it still open? Then you could say yes it's now been fully debounced and you can actually process it. And I, I'll uh, show you in, in software later in the video here how to do that. But let's first look at the schematic and I'll just show you how the uh, switches are hooked up and what the purpose of these resistors that you see around each of the switches is. Alright, let's look at the schematic here and see how the four push button switches, which are these guys here, are connected to the same I.O. pins as the data bus of the display. This is the display up here. And you can see I've got two sets of resistors on each of the uh, switches. So when the switch is open, these 10K resistors here pull up the lines to 5 volts when the lines are not being driven by the display. Now, um, when the uh, software for scanning the keypad wants to see if a key is pushed, it will change these four I.O. pins from output to input. And then these resistors will pull the line up to 5 volts if none of the switches are pushed and if one switch gets pushed it'll get pulled down to almost ground but it, the uh, microcontroller will think it's a zero instead of a one. And what I've done here is I've put these 330 ohm resistors in series with the switch and the I.O. port so that um, if, you've, if the user has pushed the push button and connected it to ground and the I.O. pin is driving a high to the display you won't damage the I.O. pin. You'll just the I.O. pin will just see 330 ohms to ground, and that's well with the current that that circuit draws will be well within the ability of the I.O. pin to provide that current, and it won't be damaged. 
and that won't affect how the display works either. This this output is strong enough to override this resistor, so even if you push down all the push button switches, the display would still update. And um, this keypad, the four keys are scanned every 20 milliseconds, and the rest of the and for a very short period of time, and then for the rest of the time. Um, these outputs or these pins are out actually outputs and they can drive the display. So before I get into the uh, the guts of the software um, which I'm going to develop as a software state machine and uh, I think um, the definition of that and what it means state machine will come apparent as we go through this but um, what I'm going to show you first here is is the state diagram and uh, you first need to understand that this is not the flow of the software from one instruction to the next this is the flow of the state of the software and each one of these circles here is a different state but the software is pretty much doing the same thing in each of these states it's running through very similar or even the same code there's just a number and a variable that determines what state it's, it's in and it'll go from one state to the next depending on what event occurs and uh, it, when it detects that event it looks at the state that's existing and then it decides what to do and what to what the next state should be in for example this is the state that's going to sit in most of the time we have no key being processed no key is being pressed I mean, you're not pounding on the keys all the time and in terms of microcontroller time um, debouncing a key is very very quick and uh, so most of the time the uh, state machine is in this state here it's not it's only waiting for a key to be pressed and the uh, the only event that gets it out of this state is if it detects that one of the keys has been closed and if that if it does so it uh, closes the, or it detects the key is closed and it remembers that state and then or sorry it remembers that key which key was actually closed and then it changes the state variable to be in the next state but it's still just sitting through the same code here scanning the, the switch um, and then it, it'll come back and look at the switch again 20 milliseconds later which is what this little loop here means it waits 20 milliseconds and it can go off in either of two different directions here if the key is still closed it will go to the next state here if the key, if it, the key is open then it'll go back to the uh, no key being processed the beginning state uh, if the key is closed, so then it's waited the 20 milliseconds, the bouncing is stopped, and so it, it you can tell the rest of the world that yes, this key has been debounced closed. It's been uh, the key has actually been pressed. And what it should do, have I written it down in here? Oh, it doesn't do that. Um, I deb I yeah. Let's go on to the next state. So we can go into two different states here from this state depending on, on what happens to the key. Um, when it gets into this state here that the key has been debounced closed, it starts a timer. And one of two things can happen depending on the state of the timer or what the key is doing. And if the timer times out, it'll go down into this state. And uh, But I'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, if the key gets opened, that is the key has been released, the push button has been pushed and then released. Uh, it'll go to this state, and um, but it's not been debounced in yet, so it's going to wait in this state for 20 milliseconds. And then again, either of two paths can be taken here. If it detects that the key is closed again, it'll stay in this state and continue decorating this timer. If it detected that the key was now open, it will set a flag that tells the rest of the world that that key has been pushed and released. So. What I'm talking about is, is this here. What it's detecting is this kind of thing. The other state that it goes down to with this timer is detecting if I push and hold it. So each of these keys will have two possibilities. One is just a press and release. The other one is push and hold. And if you hold it for more than a second, it will set a different flag stating that that key has been held. And so what it does is it actually effectively gives me four push but or sorry eight push buttons, two for each of these, depending on whether you push and release or push and hold. So that's what this this extra loop here, this extra path in the state machine is. It goes down here, 
uh, it checks to see if the key is closed and the timer is timed out and if so it goes into this state here and it, it decides that yes the key has been held for longer than a second it sets another flag and it'll just stay in this state forever as long as you hold that key once you release the key it detects that and it go in, goes into this state so um, it means that the key has been detected open but has not yet been debounced so it waits another 20 milliseconds and if the key is closed it will go back to this state or if the key is now open it goes right back to the beginning here so this is how um, a very simple there's uh, four states this this works in this is a very simple state machine but um, I find that this is the easiest way to um, to implement this kind of software and, and it works best because what I'm going to be doing in the software is um, the code that runs all this isn't running continuously it gets called and runs every 20 milliseconds and it does a little bit of operations it checks all the states and all this um, whatever it's doing here the keys and the timers etc etc and then it then it returns and it goes away and then in the next 20 milliseconds you get called again and it'll do all that same stuff again to check to see what's changed if it needs to change states etc etc so every 20 milliseconds the main software that runs all this state gets called and it, it executes very quickly um, and the, it's a very efficient way of running the uh, the key detect software it doesn't take much processor power to actually do it and it gives you time to do lots of other things and still debounce your keys uh, every 20 milliseconds okay here's the uh, the software that drives the state machine that I just described and I've had to include a few things here uh, integer types because I'm using um, a bunch of different types of uh, variables here and I need the definitions of those uh, this um, library is the uh, IO and so it describes the IO pins of the particular microcontroller that we're using and again I'm not using the Arduino world to run this I'm using a more direct approach and where I'm accessing the uh, microcontrollers um, registers for controlling the IO ports directly and then uh, I include um, its own header file here which is this one it just contains some flags that are public so if you look at how I've done this each flag is a different bit in the uh, uh, the one byte and then uh, these are um, the different states the different um, not the states the different uh, keys press so this state is or this variable is or you know, it's hard to describe what I'm talking about here this variable this uh, I'll call it a state for the moment it's going to get confusing when I talk about states later but this means that there's no keys pressed this means that the first key is pressed the second key the third key the fourth key this means the first key is held the second key is held the third key and the fourth key is held and the way I've numbered the keys is the with a display in the normal orientation the leftmost key is key one and the rightmost key is key four here I define the class PB keys or push button keys and uh, these are just the, the uh, different uh, methods that I have in that class run is the main guts of it all it's the one that runs the state machine and this is the one that gets called every 20 milliseconds um, when a flag a key flag gets set as in the keys get when a key is pressed or held and its corresponding flag is set um, it doesn't get cleared you're able to read it in your software outside of this class but it doesn't automatically get, get cleared so you need to clear it and that's what this function does here it just clears all the different key flags or I can use this function here to clear, clear to clear the flag of a particular key either a pressed or a held key um, I can't remember what get in avail oh, available here is something that can be called periodically that tells you that a key has been pressed and get now I remember what a get does it gets um, a variable that contains all of the flags um, that are set or cleared by the uh, when a key is pushed or held and so you can decode them yourself and that's what um, these defines are so you can figure out which key is which uh, and that's it for the header file 
and let's look at the main software. So I again use this enumeration statement here that just assigns a number, a different number to each one of these. So it's this one's zero, this one's one, two, three, four, and five. I don't really care what these numbers are as long as they're different because later on in the code I actually look at the, those numbers and, and use them to decide what to do next. Uh, I've defined the uh, key hold time. This is the timer count and it counts the number of 20 milliseconds. So 50 times 20 milliseconds is one second and this is the key hold time. These are the local variables here. Uh, key state holds the uh, one of these numbers here. Um, the key held and the key pressed flags are just a, a byte that holds a bits, um, one bit for each of the keys. So there's uh, four bits in this for the held flags and four bits in this for the pressed flags. And the reason why I didn't put them into one byte is because for the same reason um, that we use the, remember on the liquid crystal display, we could choose which nibble of the port that you could use, the upper or the lower nibble. Well, the same thing can be done in this software. You can choose whether it's the upper or the lower nibble that you're, uh, you're going to um, uh, connect these four push button switches to. And so uh, if it happens to be the upper nibble, then all of the flags here will be in the upper nibble of this byte. And conversely, if it's a lower nibble of the I.O. port that the four, bit, four push button switches are hooked up to, then the lower nibble of these um, will, be in, will be holding the flags. This is just a variable to hold this timer up here. And uh, where are we here? This is a mask. It just preserves the port bits that are not being used. Remember that uh, we have to. If I, what I'm doing when I when I uh, pull the keys, I look at the um, the keys. I look at the whole port. I read the whole port in, but I don't want to be looking at the part of the port that's not being used by the keys. So I have to mask it off, and that's what that this uh, is for. And it's a variable because um, I don't know which is going to be the upper or the lower port. It depends on how this um, class is actually instantiated. <coughs> so this holds a pointer to the port that the keys are on. This holds the pointer to the data direction register so I can set the pins where their inputs or outputs. And this holds a, a pointer to the port that you read to get the values that are on the pins. So in the constructor here, <coughs> you give it one um, uh, parameter here, which is the pin, um, the uppermost bit of the uh, nibble that you're going to use on the I.O. port. And then here we use this pin here to figure out which um, um, what the input port and the data direction register and the output port are, the addresses of those. And so this just simply sets up the addresses that these pointers contain. Remember a pointer is a variable in memory that holds an address that, that points to a variable. Um, it's not um, a variable itself. It simply points to something somewhere in memory. So we're pointing to the I.O. port that the input pins or the input register is on that I.O. port. <coughs> this is where I determine um, the mask, which is exactly the same as what I did in the LCD software. I just look at the pin and uh, determine whether it's the upper nibble or the lower nibble. I initialize some of these variables. Uh, key state is initialized to no process. Uh, there's no keys being processed. I initialize the key hold timer to the time, the 50, 50 times 20 microseconds, and I clear the flags. Now this is the nitty gritty here, this run method. Let's just sit past it for a moment. I want to look at some of these other simpler functions um, we saw when I was looking at the header file, the clear all, well this just simply clears the two variables that are holding all the flags. This one here is clear key, so it receives a code that represents the key. 
whether it's a different code for the same key whether it's pressed or held and it just um, looks at the mask here to determine whether you you're uh, using the upper or lower nibble within these um, variables and then if it's the upper nibble we just shift it into the lower nibble and it makes it easier to um, to uh, uh, de just to de determine what you're doing because it's the same I want to use the same piece of code down here so I just make these look the same and I put that flags into a temporary variable here actually no what I'm doing here is putting the press flags together with the held flags and the key press flags occupy the lower nibble and the held fly flags occupy the upper nibble my apologies for gapping in my memory here. Um, I wrote this stuff again, where is the date in here, in 2012. So actually, I initially wrote it in 2009. So um, I haven't looked at it for a while. So that's why I'm kind of gapping on a few things here. Uh, so anyways, this returns a single bit based on a code that it's given. Um, and it's asking which key I want to clear and it just clears that particular key and then what it does here is it disassembles the uh, temporary variable that has both the key held and the key pressed flags and it disassembles them back into their respective pressed and held variables get it just tests the key flags and it returns one of these codes that we saw here um, that determines what key has been pressed or held. So again, I uh, assemble these um, flags into one uh, into one variable, and then I just look at that variable, um, and I look at one bit at a time in the variable, and then I pr um, return one of these codes. One of these codes here. That's why I needed the. Uh, header file in here and so and this just does it over and over again one for each of the eight flags that we have one for each of the four pressed key flags and one for each of the four held key flags and if none of them are pressed it just returns the no key code finally uh, available it just looks at all the flags and it, it well again it reassembles these uh, flags all into one byte from the two bytes and then it just returns the whole mess of flags and uh, that way you can determine what flags have been pushed or held uh, on your own without using this code here and basically it just gives you um, if there's no flags no keys pressed or held then this variable temp that it returns will be zero and otherwise if any flag has been pressed or held any key has been pressed or held one of the flags will be set and this variable will not will be non-zero so let's scroll back up to the top of the run method. So um, what I need to do, the first thing I have to do here's well first of all here's the variables that I declare. And um, I'm gonna save the old data direction register or the, the older the previous value of the data direction register so that I can set it back again. Because the um, unused um, bits of the data of the data direction or the unused bits of the ports that are not being used for the keypad can be uh, either inputs or outputs depending on what you're using them for and so I want to preserve that when I start playing with that register so I initially I'll take a copy of that data direction register and store it for the time that this function runs and then I'm going to restore that register because remember we have to take the four bits that the keys are connected to because they're, they're uh, outputs most of the time because they're driving the display and then uh, I got to turn them into inputs <coughs> so that's what happens here oh and then this here variable um, it just remembers it takes it basically takes a snapshot of the uh, the IO port that the keys are hooked up to and uh, it notes the state whether you know which keys pushed or which keys are re released and I want to remember that I make it static because I don't want this variable to go away after this our run function ha or the run method has, has finished I want to make sure it's kept because I'm going to use it the next time 
So here, uh, the first thing we do is just take a copy of the old data direction register. And then here, I take it and I take the mask, which I've already figured out what to do in, in what the mask looks like in the uh, constructor. And so I um, use the mask to uh, clear off the pins Oh, actually, no. It, it just immediately makes the um, the pins that I'm interested in uh, into inputs, which means they're writing a zero. That's where you're doing an and with a tilde. This tilde symbol here just means take every bit in this um, variable and invert them. So a one becomes a zero, and a zero becomes a one. And so what this does is it writes um, it writes zeros to the four bits that are connected to the uh, the keypad and it makes that those four bits into inputs so you can actually read that keypad now I have this if statement here which actually um, is the main part of this function and so if there is a key already being processed this is going to be if there's no keys being processed this is a zero and a zero is the same as a false so if false we don't execute anything inside the curly brackets in an if statement if this is true and a true is any non-zero value so it could be 1 through 255 um, and that's considered true so if um, the state has if we're doing something we're not um, we're processing a key then this is going to be greater than zero and this will execute this will uh, come out as true and uh, then this code down here will execute and there's quite a bit of code in here and I'll just sh highlight this curly bracket to show you the end of the if statement which is way down here so <clears throat> the first thing it does is it, it just it uh, turns the IO port that the keys are hooked up to into an input into inputs and then it looks to see if there's anything being processed if there's nothing being processed no keys have been detected pressed it won't execute all that code I just scrolled through. It'll drop through. It does the else here. And this is where we're actually reading the, uh, the port, the keys. And so, and, um, so this part of the statement here, without the tilde, is simply... <coughs> uh, well, hang on. This is not reading it just at this point yet. Um, it, this is the mask that we determined in the constructor. It just simply masks off the pins that we're not interested in. And um, ends the mask with the input port. So it's looking at the pins that we're interested in. And um, when a key is pressed, is actively pressed, its corresponding pin goes low. When a key is not pressed, that pin is high. So what we're doing is we're looking for any of the low pins, any of the pins to be low, but I want to make this if statement work, so I have to invert that reading. So if any of the pins are high, because I've inverted it, then this will execute. So if any key has been pressed, then this bit of code will execute. And what it does is it reads the, ma reads the port again, kind of like up here, and puts it into this variable key code, which is not going to go away when this function ends or this method is finished. It will re be remembered for the next time because we're going to compare it with what we read the second time around. This is how I determine if a key that was pressed previously is still pressed, as I compare it to what I saved from this statement the next time around. So I change, and then after I've done that, I'll change the state to the next state, which is a key has been detected as being closed, but it's not yet debounced. And then it, it executes this, uh, it executes these two statements, falls through, and then this statement here is simply writing the old data direction register contents back to the data direction register to turn the uh, uh, the key port back into output so that it can drive the display. Now, the way what makes this multiplexing work between the, the uh, liquid crystal display and the push button keys sharing the same I/O pins is that 
um, one of the devices sharing the pins has to be always used as an output and never an input and the other device that's sharing the same pins must always be used as an input and never an output device so that works well with the liquid crystal display because um, we're never going to uh, change those four pins to inputs in order to operate the liquid crystal display once when we're running the liquid crystal display those four pins are always outputs vice versa with the keypad whenever we're d running the keypad software those pins are always inputs and there are never outputs and so that's what makes this multiplexing work if um, either of those functions had to change the input or outputs of the pins while they were op actually operating um, you wouldn't be able to multiplex the, um, the keypad and the display on the same set of pins you have to use separate pins so now we've detected the key has been closed we store that um, value of the, of the uh, input port so we know that one of those bits is now set because the key was pressed remember a key being pressed is a low on the port we read that in here and then we invert it and so um, all the zeros becomes ones and all the ones become zeros and in this case the IO port will be always high because no no except for the key that's pressed which will become low but I want to turn that around because it makes more sense to do it when a bit is set indicating that something's happened so I invert those bits and then I store it in this uh, variable that's going to be preserved when this um, method ends and so it's been called once and it's finished with its, what it's doing the uh, rest of the software that called it is doing whatever it needs to do 20 milliseconds elapses and then this function gets called again but this time state pb key state is something else so now we've detected that pb key state is not zero anymore it's got a value that's greater than zero and so we're going to execute all of some of this code that's down in here inside the if statement and the first thing i do is this switch statement here and again it's most of the code is this switch statement there's the end of it very and this was the end of the if statement so what we do with the case or the switch statement is we look at the uh, pb key state remember we changed it down here at the bottom into pb keys not or close not debounced so up here we will switch that statement and then we will look at the different cases uh, or the, the the different states here so between the case and the break statement is what executes when the key when this state is occur when when the uh, state machine is in this particular state and then this is the other the next state and so this code here will execute only in that second state or if the state machine is in the third state this is the third state the fourth state and the fifth state and that's what happens so essentially like I mentioned when I was showing you the state diagram pretty much the same code gets executed at whatever state you're in except for these little bits here that are in between like, that uh, are determined by the states so let's look at the first state which is the key close but not debounce so what we do is we read the IO port again and we compare it to what we got the last time and if they compare then um, so that means that the key is still pressed so we go and we change the state to the next state which is the key is now pressed and if they don't compare which means the key has been released then we just go back to the beginning proce um, not processed state and uh, that's all that gets executed so this this gets executed very quickly the run method stops and the rest of the software takes over so now that we have this state in our state variable when run gets executed again it goes through all of this it switches the IO ports to inputs it reads the I um, sorry it doesn't read the IO port um, it checks the state to see if it's not the zero state and in this case it isn't it's not uh, in state number two so it switches state to find out where it's supposed to go and this is the number two state where the, we know now that the 
the key definitely has been pressed. The bouncing has stopped and, and the key is still closed. So um, we read again the keypad and we compare it to the previous code. And here's where we are decrementing the uh, key hold timer. So um, right here, if the key port is red and it's different than the previous time, which means the key is not held any longer, then we go to the next state, which is the keys pressed open but it's not debounced. That was the upper four states that I had in my state diagram. And so we'll ignore this key timer thing for the moment. Let's do the uh, key pressed open. So we're just doing a press and release of the key. So anyways, the uh, this function run execute or exits, it's done. 20 milliseconds later it gets called again. And now we are in this state, the key has been pressed, but now it's open, but not debounced. So it goes back, it switches state, and we'll go down to the next state, which is here. Been pressed, but it's open, but not debounced. It reads the port again. And if the port, if it matches, that it's still open, then it resets the key held timer. It returns the key, the state pro, uh, state machine to the no process state and here's where we set the flag indicating that the key has been pressed and then we're done this is the end of, of uh, run so you can see that run really doesn't take much code it's very quick it only it looks like a lot of code here but only one of these things executes at a time so that's the uh, um, the code for the key being pressed and released. All right, so what if the key was still held and not released? So here um, it checked and it discovered that the key was released. So then it will execute this statement here and go into the next state for debouncing open. But now I'm looking at a different state where it has um, the key has been held still, it's not been released. And so it will execute this part of the if statement here and there's another if statement inside of it so what it first what it's doing then is it's it just decrements the key held timer and then it, and it's finished and run exits and it waits another 20 milliseconds and run gets called again we're still in the key pressed state and so we will do all this code again we'll decrement the timer once one and the, and assuming that the key is still held We'll decrement the timer and we'll keep doing this over and over every 20 milliseconds and finally the timer time gets decremented to zero. And then what happens is um, this, the value of this timer will be evaluated by the if statement. And remember a zero is a false. So if we didn't, so if I, if this um, timer reached zero, this statement would never execute. So what I do is I invert the logic here and that make it true so what actually let's go back a bit before key held timer is zero it, it's a value it's got a number it's greater than zero and uh, what I do is I the if statement looks at that and says oh it's a it's a one or it's a non zero value so it's a true but I don't want it to execute this code here while the key held timer has a value in it and so that's what the, the exclamation mark here, that's a not. And that inverts the logic of the if statement here. Also, um, you see these two negative signs. That's a shorthand way of decrementing key held timer. And uh, by putting those two signs before the variable, it means decrement the variable first and then do something with the variable. I can move these two minus signs over to this end here to the... Uh, and that what that means is post decrement and that means do something with the timer and then decrement it and in this case I want to make sure that the timer is detected to be at zero and so um, when the timer finally reaches zero this bunch of code here will execute we will reset the timer because I want to be able to use it the next time um, I will set the state to key held 
and then I will set one of the key held flags corresponding to the key that has been pressed. Remember this variable contains a one where the key uh, a one in the in the bit that corresponds to the key that was pressed and I simply just copy that or or it in actually but I set that corresponding bit in the key held flags variable and then that's the end the run is X run statement is is finished again it was very short but now the state is in this state PB key held next time run is called it will end up down here the key held state and what we're doing here is we're just waiting until the push button gets released and as long as the push button is held closed which is what we're doing here we're checking the push button again and if it's still held this if statement will not execute and nothing will change the state will be always this and every time key or every time run is run it will come back to this and it just keeps checking the keys over and over again is that same key still being still closed yes it is do nothing finally when the operator releases that key this will um, this statement here will execute and all we're doing is change the state machine to the next state which is the key was held it's now open but it's not debounced and then run x6 exits and we're done with it until the next 20 milliseconds has passed this uh, run statement is called again and this time we end up down here which is the same as this state and which means that the key has been released but it's not been debounced released we're not for sure we're not sure that it's completely released yet so we read the keys and we check to see if it has been released um, up here in the previous state I've actually sorry let's keep going here uh, anyways it checks to see if the key has actually been released and if it has this code will execute if the key has not been released this uh, the state is not changed and it'll keep coming back to this state checking the pin the keys until finally the key has been shown open and then what it does is that uh, it resets the timer because uh, I want to use it again although uh, I think it was already done up here but I, I just did it anyways and then it sets the state machine down to to the first state again when no keys are being processed and it sets the held flag or the key pressed flag oops I we already went through this error error I got the wrong state so the key was held and now released so this state is uh, set here key held open not debounced so it, it ends up um, down here key held open not debounced sorry I think I may have uh, okay I thought I changed something in my software so the final state the key was held open and it was but it's not it's now open but it's not debounced so what it does is it reads that port again and it compares it to the code that it read previously and if they are equal which means the key is now open and it, it's still open after 20 milliseconds um, break here means just jump out of here to the end of this function and um, the uh, oh sorry this one here is if the key is still closed we're just going to do nothing my mistake we're reading the keys again we're comparing it to the previous state of the keys and if it's the same obviously the key is still closed or it got reclosed after it opened we do nothing we're just going to stay in this state and, and looking until the key gets the, uh, opened and when, it, when it finally opens the else statement will execute and we simply say that the key uh, state machine is now in the not processed state so um, this is a, a quick overview of the run um, method which implements the state machine that I showed you in the drawing previously um, what I recommend you do is go back to the part of the video with the drawing and maybe sketch it out yourself on a piece of paper and then follow it through as we go through as I go through uh, the video 
um, as I go through in the video of every one of these different states. So um, this is how a state machine operates and this is how I've implemented that hand drawing of the state diagram that I showed you previously. And uh, this idea of state machines and checking different events that go on to change the state or, or the or whatever, um, this is how state machines work and this is a, um, a way that you can implement different kinds of state machines. Okay, let's have a look at the Arduino code um, that uh, just implements that very simple demo that you saw at the beginning of this uh, video. And the uh, first thing you need to do is import the two libraries, one for the uh, liquid crystal display and one for the push buttons. And I should um, reiterate here, or make a note here, that these two libraries work independent of each other. Um, neither needs the other to operate. So if you have a display and a different kind of keypad, or you don't need any kind of uh, inputs, you can just import the, the display library, and it'll work all just fine by itself. You don't need to include this one. And vice versa, if you just have a bunch of push buttons and maybe a different kind of display, um, you can just implement, or just import the uh, the push button drivers and it'll work just fine all by itself. So here I declare some defines and uh, the liquid crystal display driver needs to know what port the uh, data port the data pins of the display are connected to and, it, and I, it wants to know the the uppermost bit of that nibble of the port and so uh, it's Arduino pin number seven is the uppermost nibble or uppermost bit of the nibble of that port. If it had been the lower nibble of the same port I would have used Arduino pin number three. Same with the uh, well that's for the key ports, uh, for the liquid crystal display same thing I uh, have to and I use the same one of course because we're using the same port same pins for both. The liquid crystal needs to know which um, of the control pins which what ports they're hooked up to and these could be any of the Arduino pin numbers except for um, the nibble that the dis the, uh, li the LCD display data bus is on so we could put 0, 1, 2 or 3 in here or 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 or 13 but not um, 4, 5, 6 or 7 uh, the liquid crystal display driver needs to know how many rows and columns the display has and then um, I'm going to just flash an LED. This is the pin that's on the Arduino board that has an LED attached to it. It happens to be pin number 13. Um, this is the, uh, the number of milliseconds that I'm going to wait between calls to the run method of the push button keypad driver. And this is a timer or a time count that counts the number of 20 millisecond clicks and that runs the uh, the flashing LED and I have the LED flashing on for 500 milliseconds and off for 500 milliseconds and so 20 times so this is the number of 20 millisecond counts so 20 times 25 is 500 which is 500 milliseconds now here I create an instance of each of the drivers the keypad only requires one parameter which is what port is the keypad hooked up to and that was defined up here and then down here the liquid crystal display requires a few more parameters it needs to know the port what the RS pins connected to what the E pins connected to and the number of rows and columns and you notice how if um, how much more readable this statement is here if I use actual uh, names here which I defined up here I could and it would work just as well software would work just as well I could just put numbers in here, but it, it's not as meaningful to you to look at the software to see where, what, what the, each of these parameters means. So that's why I like to do all of these kinds of define statement stuff up in f at the beginning of my software. It's uh, this is actually good, proper, good quality engine uh, software engineering techniques is doing this. Uh, the next is a variable called key timer and this is where I take a snapshot of the uh, this of the millisecond timer this is a an Arduino function called millis millis or milliseconds 
And what it does is it takes a snapshot of a timer that's running continuously as long as you're running your Arduino. And the timer starts at zero when the Arduino first powers up. And every time the Arduino is powered up, the timer gets reset to zero. And it's just a count of the number of milliseconds that the Arduino has been running for. And uh, it's a big number. It's 32 bits long, so it takes four bytes or a long. So I've got to make sure this is big enough to take all of that in, all of that number. And I'll show you how I'm using this lower down. This is another timer, and this just times the uh, the blink time of the LED. And I'll show you again how this gets used down below. Now in the setup routine, which just gets called once, um, I need to make sure that the LED pin is an output because when an Arduino starts up, the microcontroller um, has all of its I.O. pins set to input and you have to change that if you want to use an output pin. Now here I call the initialization routine for the liquid crystal display and I chose to take this routine out of the constructor and not and uh, to allow the user, the writer of this software, to use it. Um, and I did that because sometimes you've got a project where you're maybe uh, needing to save power because it's battery driven and you want to shut off different peripherals that are not being used. So if the display is not being used, you can actually power down the display and save some, some power. And then when you power it back up, the display will come up into a mode that it's not uh, useful in this case because it comes up in 8-bit mode and we want it in 4-bit mode. So I just um, took the initialization routine and separated it from the constructor and allowed the user to call that routine, that uh, method, uh, whenever they need it. And so I need to call that, otherwise um, we won't be able to see anything on the display. And then the next thing I do here is I just take a quick snapshot of the timer, the millisecond timer down here in loop and this loop gets called um, regularly it, it runs continuously over and over and over again it's a permanent loop and, and this is where most of you, the work gets done with this keypad and display um, I declared a variable key here all this is going to do is store a key code that's returned by the uh, the keypad routine and we use it to uh, make decisions later on so in this first if statement here, um, there's a bit of code in here, and what the if statement does is it takes another picture of the uh, millisecond timer, and it compares it to by subtracting the previous one that we took, and it sees if, it, if the elapsed time is greater than the 20 millisecond key time that we declared up here. 20. And um, if it is, then this code is executed. If not, if 20 milliseconds hasn't elapsed, none of this code gets executed and this next next if statement gets done. And what it does is it calls the keypad get routine which gets all of the keypad flags and it looks to see if any of the keypad flags are set or not. And it also stores that value in the variable key. And so what it means is if uh, key is equal to zero after this routine is called that's a false and so this if statement will not execute which means no keys have been pressed so we're not going to do anything in here and that's how this uh, loop runs continuously most of the time both of these if statements are going to result in a, a false and nothing's going to run in here except it just keeps flipping through here now when 20 milliseconds has elapsed this statement will become true and so this code will run so the first thing I do here is I reset key timer, I take another snapshot of the time so that I can do the next comparison later on. And then I run the keypad run routine here. And that is the one that we just went through. And this is the, the guts of the keypad routine where it looks at the keys and determines if a key's been pressed, it checks the state machine, etc, etc. And remember, it runs very quickly, so this this uh, function here, this this method here, is going to just uh, return very quickly, and then it will continue on in the code here. And this is where the heartbeat flag or the, the heartbeat um, timer is used. And what I do is I pre-decrement it, and then I check to see if it's equal to zero. And when it becomes zero, um, then this will execute. 
actually, I'm amazed this actually works because, oh yes, if heartbeat is equal to zero, that's um, a true or false there. So if, if heartbeat is decremented to zero and it equals zero, then therefore the if statement here becomes true and then this code will execute. Um, if heartbeat does not uh, become zero after decrementing, then this code here will not execute. And then it will just drop through and then do this one here. But let's show you what happens when heartbeat becomes zero. So the heartbeat timer is timed out. I reset the timer with this statement here. And then I look to see which, uh, what the state of the uh, LED pin is. Is it high or is it low? And then I just set it to the opposite state here. So if the LED pin is high, I set it to low. So that means if the if statement is true, I write out a low to that pin. If this if statement is false, then I write out a high to that pin. And that simply toggles the pin back and forth. So every heartbeat time, the uh, pin is held high, and then the next heartbeat time, it's held low. And that gives you the half second on and half second off. Down here, I do the get, root, the get routine, and I check to see if any keys have been pressed. If a key has been pressed, this will be a true. It'll, it'll equal something not zero, and it'll be a true. And so the code in here will now execute. And the first thing I do is I clear the display. I just take whatever message is on there previously and I wipe it off. And then I look at what key flag was returned, what key code was returned. And so I switch key and then here are the uh, eight different codes depending on what the key, what key was pressed or what key was held. And I just simply do something for each of those states. And so um, I set the cursor to a location on the screen here. It's a uh, character zero, line zero. So it's the first character on the upper line, the first line. And then I just simply uh, output this message to this, the LCD and it gets printed on the LCD. Um, I could also, instead of calling the print function here, I could have put, I could have called the, um, what, I, what did I call it now? Um, put string function or the put string method in the display, the liquid crystal display driver, and it would have done the same thing. It just simply outputs this string, this message to the to the screen to the LCD, and I just um, put these messages on different lines. So the first message goes on the first line, the second message is on the second line, and then the, this third one here goes back to the first line, and this one goes back to the fourth line, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So whenever this um, if statement is true, only one of these case statements will be true, and so only one of these will get executed. Display clear gets executed every time, so the previous message gets wiped off and then a new one's put on. And then the case statement, <coughs> or the, the switch statement drops to the, uh, the end here, and then it executes clear all. <coughs> and what that does is it clears all of the flags in the uh, keypad routine. And so that what happens if I don't do that, that bit of whatever key was pressed or held will be set and continually set. The keypad routine doesn't clear it. And so the next time through this loop, the, um, it will see that there's that key is still pressed and still it'll execute one of these statements again and, and output the same message. We don't want that to happen. We only want to detect one key press and then wait for the next key press. And so here I have to clear all the flags from the key pad routine. <coughs> and so anyways, this is how it all runs. It's a very simple demonstration software for the keypad, uh, or for the keypad and the display. All right, just to demonstrate what you get here, push this key and there's the message, it comes up. Push the second key, third key goes back to the first line, fourth key goes to the Second line, you push and hold the first key, you get a different message. Same with the second key, the third key, and the fourth key. So that's how the, the demo software works, implementing the two different liquid crystal display and keypad drivers. And if I flip this on the side here, you'll be able to see the blinking LED. So that was a video, or two videos, um, rather long, I, but I hope it uh, explained to you uh, uh, how to do this in a, a way that you can understand it. 
implementing uh, a simple user interface using a keypad of four keys and a liquid crystal display, a standard liquid crystal display that these are pretty common and uh, I described the software that I wrote for each of the drivers and I described how to um, multiplex the two together so that you can save IO pins. So I hope you enjoyed this video and uh, stick around for the next one. I'll see you the next time. Bye for now.